Good afternoon and a warm welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Shriyal Setumadhavan and I'm the Features Editor of Construction World. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar on Design Build Trends. This is our third webinar in a series of webinars that we've been conducting as a countdown to the upcoming Construction World Architect and Builder Awards. We would like to thank our presenting partner for today, RAK Ceramics. A special thanks to our keynote speaker, uh, to our moderator, to each one of our panelists and our audience for making the time to virtually be with us today. So uh, be before we begin with our topic for discussion today, a short PPT on construction world and our upcoming events. 25 years in running, Construction World is India's largest circulated construction magazine. Uh, with distribution across 800 cities in India and overseas. CW prides in delivering the most authentic, trusted, up-to-date and timely information about the construction business and has been honoured with several awards, including the CIDC Vishwakarma Awards. Here is a glimpse of a few of our past edition covers. Uh, as you can see in the March edition, we had path breaking interviews of Mr. Nitin Gadkari, Mr. Hardeep Singh Puri, and Mr. TV Somanathan. A large part of our focus in the recent, recent past has also shifted to the digital world. And I think the screen uh, right now that you can see, you know, speaks about it all. Uh, the numbers say it all uh, in terms of how we have approached our, uh, you know, digital. Um, plans and uh, the kind of achievements we've had with all of it. If you haven't already done this, then you can do it now. Subscribe to See Wow, which is Construction World on WhatsApp, to get regular updates on the go on daily basis. See Wow already has over 11,500 subscribers and all of you, all you need to do to avail this services, give a missed call on the number that's reflecting on your screen right now. So what I'll suggest is take a screenshot, keep it, you can do it later, but give a missed call and do not forget to save the number to continue receiving updates from us. Also, as part of our exclusive offering is CW Gold. Uh, it's a weekly offering through which you can stay updated on exclusive content related to the construction, infrastructure, real estate, and building materials sectors on, like I mentioned, a weekly basis. Uh, we always have a lot of exciting offers for you, not just for Construction World, but all our sister publications. You can see a glimpse of it on my screen. So another chance, another reason why you want to take a screenshot, if you want to know about all our subscription offers, you can connect with our subscription team at subscriber at ASAP, ASAPP, infoglobal.com. We also have our offices span India and irrespective of which region you are in, you can reach out to our team as well as stay connected with us through our social media handles on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. So see you there as well. Uh, very quickly, a few of our upcoming events. On 20th August, of course, we will be hosting our very own Quab Awards, the Construction World Architect and Builder Awards. This is our 16th year of awarding India's top architects and builders and noteworthy projects, and the second year that we would be hosting the awards virtually. This year, our theme is React, to respond to the environment with awareness, creativity, and technology. So we're just two days away and do not forget to join us there. Also, I'm delighted to share that our guest of honor at Quab this year is Dr. Vibha Dhawan, the Director General uh, of Terry. Also, stay tuned for our CW Design Build Conclave and Awards, which is going to be coming soon. We will be hosting this as an hybrid event, which means it will be physical and digital and not just in one city, but in three. We're coming up in Ahmedabad, Hyderabad and Bangalore. Looking at, uh, you know, the current state where we are in as an industry, the Indian construction industry is expected to register a growth of 13% in real terms in 2021, following a decline of 12.4% in 2020. The outbreak of uh, COVID-19 and subsequent lockdown restrictions did weigh on the industry's output last year. As construction professionals, it is important to stay up to date about the design build trends knowing and understanding trends, what influences these and how to apply them to your next design is crucial. So which factors will drive sustainability in design and build model? What role is technology going to play in the evolution of design and build construction? What are the current trends for designing the workplace post COVID considering the social distancing norms and safety aspects? 
and how is the market for project management services expected to grow in future? So let's explore the current trends and what is expected in the future with the influencers of the industry who will discuss their vision and trends coming your way. We now have our keynote speaker, architect Hafiz Contractor, address us. Uh, but before that, here is a video from our presenting partner, RAK Ceramics. Can we have the video, please? It's a story of 25 years. 1989. RAK Ceramics was established in Ras Al Khaimah by His Highness Sheikh Saud bin Sakar Al Qasimi with the vision to make it number one ceramics brand in the world. RAK Ceramics currently is a rupees 7000 crore global conglomerate that supplies its products to over 160 countries. RAK is officially recognized as the world's fourth largest tile manufacturer, Asia's largest tile manufacturer. It has a global annual production output of 300,000 square meters per day of ceramic and vitrified tiles, 50 million pieces of bathware and 20 million pieces of tableware. RAK Ceramics enjoys technological superiority as it has 14 state-of-the-art plants across UAE, Bangladesh, India and Iran. RAK Ceramics established in India in 2006 with a vision to manufacture tiles and bathware that would meet the highest standards of quality and beauty. The company has more than 8,000 designs making it among the largest range of products globally. In India, RAK Ceramics has the largest and most modern vitrified tile manufacturing plant in Samalkot in Andhra Pradesh with a manufacturing capacity of 30,000 square meters of vitrified tiles and 3,000 sanitary wear pieces per day. The plant is the one of its own kind in India using the magical sorting machines that checks for errors up to 1 millimeter in each and every tile and our manufacturing units are surrounded by a green cover that minimizes the effects of greenhouse gases and water treatment plant that allows the reuse of water in the manufacturing process. Recently, in July 2017, RAK India has entered in a joint venture manufacturing facility near Rajkot, Gujarat, which will produce 3 million square meters of ceramic tiles. It is a state-of-the-art facility and with immediate ongoing expansion it will hit 6 million square meters producing by December 2017. RAK has been working with a strong vision and dedication worth to be recognized at the most prestigious global levels. We are also actively enhancing our footprint by opening company-owned orientation centers, dealer outlets and multi-brand outlets across the country. RAK Ceramics is now ready to floor the market and clad its way to success. May I now request uh, Mr. Pratap Padude? Founder, ASAP Info Global Group and First Construction Council and Editor-in-Chief Construction World to welcome our keynote speaker, Architect Hafiz Contractor, with a few words. And welcome to QAB webinar number three, Design Build Trends. Today we have uh, Padma Bhushan, Mr. Hafiz Contractor, who heads the largest architectural firm in India with over 550 team members comprising of architects, urban town planners, interior designers, landscape artists, civil engineers, CAD operators, 3D and graphic designers. The firm has to its credit over 2,500 clients and over 7.2 billion square foot of projects in 100 cities and five countries. Mr. Hafiz contractor completed his architectural studies from Academy of Architecture in Mumbai and graduated from Columbia University, New York. He is the winner of over 75 national and international awards for excellence and contributions to architecture, including our own QAB awards for several years consecutively. He was awarded the Padma Bhushan in 2016. 
The impressive chart of work that architect contractor catalogs includes some of the tallest structures on the subcontinent. The Imperial Towers Mumbai, 23 Marina Dubai, one of the tallest residential buildings in the world. He's also modernized the two busiest airports of the country, Mumbai and Delhi, and the D.Y. Patil Cricket Stadium in Mumbai, amongst the known uh, iconic structures. His research work include proposals on the Western waterfront, waterfront development, a scheme that attempts to rejuvenate the urban environment by creating large open green spaces in Mumbai. A strong advocate of the vertical growth of cities. Ladies and gentlemen, I present architect Hafiz Contractor. Welcome, Mr. Contractor. Thank you, Mr. Pratap Patode. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, today, uh, though uh, it was supposed to be like a question and answer kind of a thing, but I would like to say that uh, we are uh, in very, very difficult times, uh, uh, the building industry, the world as an environment. And we have a, a, a phenomena which uh, uh, I don't know whether everybody is really getting conscious of, and that is the, the climate change and uh, global warming. And, and why I'm saying that it is very important for all of us is, and more important for Indians and India, because we are one nation which is growing as far as population is concerned, as far as development is concerned. In each and every way we are growing. And when one grows, uh, one does a lot of work, a lot of development, uh, new cities have to be built, uh, people have to be housed. Our population is right now 1.3. Uh, our uh, average population, we are very, very young people. Uh, they will get married. Uh, the whole demography of uh, the way we all are, uh, previously we used to be like a joint family. Now today, kids go from one city to another city. Need for housing is very, very large. And in that, uh, uh, how we are going to build our future cities is going to be the answer. And if we do it the right way, that would be the success. But then we are hinging on a very, very difficult point. The thing is today, we are a country uh, which, and we have also uh, in the last you know, uh, Paris Accord, we also agreed that we will increase our green cover. Our green cover is something like 23 or 20. You know, figures are quite difficult. We have said that we will increase it by about 10% or something like that. Our uh, urban cover is quite large, much larger than all other countries. And that is, you know, other countries are 2%, 3%. We are hinging around about uh, 9 to 10 to 11 you know, figures are quite different. Now, if we are already, and uh, uh, from another side, we have to increase our green cover, where are we going to go? And yes, we are talking about new urban areas. I feel, uh, I differ that we should not develop new urban areas. We should not gobble our farmland. The farmland has to be kept intact because we have to think about our food securities, future food securities. Now, looking at all of that, the main thing that really comes to is we have to concentrate on our present urban area. Try and reduce that. Think about redevelopment not new cities, though our beloved Prime Minister has given a boost for new smart cities, which is a very good thing. But as an urbanist and as an architect, I feel that uh, we should develop more on the present 
perimeter, don't go further. And rejuvenate our cities, make our cities more compact, more dense. We leave uh, the land for not urban growth, for agriculture, for water. All of that is what we should do. And if we do that, then India can be a different place. And I feel that we as Indians, the most important thing is today, we should give proper housing to each and every Indian. And if we do that, India will be a superpower. Thank you. If you want to ask any other questions, I'll be happy to answer. So, Mr. Contractor, you've been a strong proponent of vertical growth in cities. Given that the FSI has been relaxed over the years, do you think we are at an optimum level considering the city's infrastructure ability to withstand this, this load? See, sir, it's like this, that we are not uh, a very rich country. It's like, uh, uh, you know, we are a growing and you know developing country. If you just keep on saying infrastructure, infrastructure, you just said about the airports. We opened our skies. We never had great airports. We opened our skies. Now we are building all the airports. So the same way, huh, the people are there. People are going to you know have kids. If you do not create a uh, housing, if you do not create the vertical growth, they will be living in slums. If they are living in slums, as a people, they are a burden on the city, but they are not producing anything because half the time uh, they are wasting in collecting water, this, that. Health is bad. Housing is the most important thing for our country to be a super power because then that 1.3 each and every one is working today each and every one cannot work he's a, that congenitalitis he's got diarrhea he's you know something or the other because his house his housing is not perfect. 10, 10 people are living in uh, 8 by 10 uh, they go for uh, to have a bath somewhere else they collect water how can you be you know, uh, getting the best out of anybody. So the only way is vertical growth. Create more FSI. It's very important if you consider, uh, take any city, the number of people are there. Uh, you have to open up and you have to get your housing prices affordable on parity with your earning. You can't be keeping on saying, oh, Mumbai has got the, uh, uh, the most expensive uh, housing. It's a shame. It's a shame. You, if you cannot afford it, what is the sense? You should make your housing affordable, livable. And that is what each and every city should do. I have been saying since years and years and years. Increase your FSI, increase your FSI. Uh, do not have cap on all your heights. This is another very important thing that has to be done. Everywhere, uh, the airport authority is having caps. All airports should be thrown out of the city. They should be away. Because whatever uh, city space that we have, uh, we are curbing it. We should utilize land to its maximum capacity. Electricity can be produced. Everything can be done. You cannot produce land. Land is the most precious commodity which nobody can manufacture. You right. do, you'll do everything and everything. Land you cannot manufacture. And that is what you should preserve. And you should take care of your land. You should have compact cities, so you'll have mass transit, underground railways. Uh, then, you know, so you're not even dependent on fossil fuel. Cars, though, cars will be you know, electric, but condense. Keep 
do not misuse your land and that is why we as i am saying vertical growth vertical growth condense how, uh, mr contractor how do you see designing spaces changing with the new dcr and covid because especially now with covid coming in do you see any actual change happening in this in designing of spaces uh, yes definitely uh, time is the crux for a lot of time people are working from home and we also are working from home but efficiency is not there uh, there is a, a lot of advantages you don't have to travel one hour in the morning two hours in the evening okay uh, you have the best of the facilities at your home but it cannot function like that a little time yes but finally we all you know it's it's when you are talking you are instigating me the, this that it's the same way huh? in a group when we sit somebody will say something i say i don't agree somebody will come up with a some i agree uh, that is not happening so much on a ipad right. so for efficiency yes we will have to be but uh, uh, it, it has shown us a new way of working. Uh, uh, I was never a computer guy, uh, to be very frank. They had my whole office and everything, and I always tell somebody, oh, do this, do this. I have started using computers, and I'm not ashamed of saying that because I'm not an IT guy. Mr. Contractor, what's your advice to young architects of the current generation, given that technology has begun playing an important part in designing? See, I feel that uh, uh, the old materials uh, are going to give way. Uh, we have to think about new materials because very soon the world population also from seven it may go to thirteen. Very soon it will just tuck 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 tuck. It will health will be better. People will live longer. We have to think about. Uh, today, uh, all our buildings, you know, you go up to 100 and then the materials are not economical, nothing. We have to. I see uh, cities, uh, today you talk about 1,000 square yard and one acre plot and things like that. I am saying that cities will be 25 and 50 and buildings will be 50 acre plot will be one building. You will say that this man is a madman. Okay. No. And our buildings will go uh, 200 stories high. There will be vertical gardens, horizontal gardens. We have to think about such structures because there is going to be more seismic loads. There are more typhoons. There are more floods. Whatever we do uh, has to withstand all that. And think about 12, mil, 12 billion, 13 billion people in this world. Where are they going to live? Who is going to grow food? Where, where? We can't grow food on moon and come here. Where are you going to do all that? Preserve your land for that. So you have to come up with a new material. Yes, there are materials which are, you know, we are talking about... Uh, 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 carbon concrete and there are materials but it has to be successful 120 years back there was a lady who started doing reinforced concrete and there was one uh, american lady okay. that's how we started going high so today it's we have to come up with a new material and that's the answer what do you see as the most significant trend in the architecture practice today? What is a big change that is taking place in the architecture practice? See, uh, I don't know. Uh, at least we have changed. Uh, today, uh, money plays a very important role. Time plays a very important role. Okay. And uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, our practice... Uh, maximum amount of percentage of our practices with real estate developers and housing. And I'm very happy to do that. Uh, 
and uh, you know uh, how the housing industry is reeling under uh, interest there is that all that. so we have devised a new way of how to do economic housing and when i say economic housing if somebody else in 1 lakh square feet he was doing say flats so many flats everything is same we will give them 110 flats now somebody will say oh how is it i am giving this area same of the flats more yes we have devised a way not only that uh, so uh, we are giving 10% of usable area more and we are economizing on the construction cost so 10% area more usable area and 10% of construction cost more and now in each and every cities of india fsi is increasing and that's a very good thing that our present government is doing the previous governments never took care of any urban areas huh? they were taking care of only the rural i am not saying we should not take care of the rural huh? we should take care of the rural as well as the urban because so many rural people are going to come to the urban area so all buildings will go higher you have to think about how you are going to do economic construction in high rises how you are going to give 10% to sometimes 12 to 13% of usable area more huh? and forget about all frills gone are those days uh, when we were doing you know i also started my career with everybody uh, everybody used to call me elevational treatment now those are gone you have to think how you are using economically and each and every cubic meter of concrete is utilized in the right manner and that is her the the most efficient way of doing work and that is what is required environmentally also sustainable architecture what we are talking about huh, that is sustainable so in the next 10 years if everybody used to follow that 10% of the people will be housed free because today all that is going waste so that is sustainable architecture we just not yes using electricity efficiently using everything efficiently yes but using materials and using land efficiently and land to the maximum capacity is the most sustainable way of doing work and that is what we have translated in a lot of our projects recently in the last one year so and that is so what Mr. everyone Contractor, should do so mr and contractor i would like to uh, give talks to each and every college how they can do that i would like to ha ji please yeah so uh, so yes, on sir. the same point as you mentioned and will it therefore mean that we will not see too much of creativity yeah. in these uh, projects because uh, if everybody is going to economize and uh, you know uh, try to save costs no 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 sir no no more problems more restrictions better creativity creativity by putting uh, impediments and by putting conditions i want this i want this i want this creativity doesn't get destroyed uh, there is more creativity whenever i had problems uh, uh, i created something much much better today you don't have time but i can tell you incidences after incidences when a client came to me and said he wants this 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 and i was talking to me in my mind and said is he crazy to ask for such things but i only said it in my mind but when i applied my mind i came up with something completely different and superb and that has sent a new trend it's unless and until you have difficulty how the hell 
but you will say that I have to find a new way. Because if life is squishy, life is going on very well, you don't even feel the need. When you feel the need, then you apply your mind and say, hey, let's do something. I have to do something. That is what. So, no, creativity is never. I have always said that we as architects, uh, we, uh, we can create something completely different. An accountant and everybody, I, I ask an accountant, what is two plus two is what? He will say four. Uh, but as an architect, two plus two, 24. Because we create something. Okay. And that is the power of creation. Right. Right. Thank you, Mr. Contractor. It's It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for all your responses. Always pleasure. Always pleasure talking to you, my dear sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, your whole company and everyone. All the very best. Keep well. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. insights with us uh, we now move on towards uh, our very enthusiastic panel discussion on design build trends special thanks to our panelists for making the time to virtually join us for this empowering discussion before i hand it over to our moderator mr ramesh nair ceo india and managing director market development asia colliers here is introducing him with a few words with a diverse experience of over 24 years, Mr. Ramesh Nair's career has been focused on driving transformational change and delivering real estate solutions to domestic and multinational owners, investors and occupiers across India and South Asia. In his current role, his key responsibilities include driving long-term sustainable and profitable growth for Colliers, along with developing the company's short-term and long-term strategy. He also drives business development and key relationship management across Asia to expand the company's client base and identify new service lines and opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Nair, for joining us today. Introducing our panelists who would be joining him in the discussion. Uh, please welcome Ms. Sheetal Rakheja, Managing Partner, Aon Design and Development, LLP. Ms. Sheetal Rakheja is an accredited Green Building Professional, uh, Chair IGBC Delhi Chapter and member of the IGBC Executive Committee. She is a firm believer in sustainable architecture. With an experience of 23 years, she has designed over 100 projects covering a staggering 50 million square feet of built space. Shunya, which is India's first net zero energy home, is one of her research development projects made completely out of waste. Her projects set a benchmark in energy efficiency in the industry. Next, please welcome Mr. Sumit Rakshit, Managing Director and Head of Project Management Services, Savills. Mr. Sumit Rakshit has over 25 years of real estate experience in transaction, design and construction, program, project and facility management. He is skilled at creating world-class workplaces and has a track record of producing, presenting and managing the implementation of real estate solutions and managing executive expectations. He is a member of RICS and in his current role is fully accountable for the India project management businesses. Also, please welcome uh, Mr. Ravi Sarangan, Executive Director, Edifice. Mr. Ravi Sarangan is a recipient of numerous awards and recognitions from within the fraternity. He has been instrumental in growing Edifice to its current preeminent position within the profession. He currently oversees the firm's brand management, handles key clients and participates in the creative design process. He also delivers lectures on the design and practice of architecture, as well as serves on the jury of various eminent design award competitions. Please welcome Mr. Anil Bijawat, CEO, RAK Ceramics India. Mr. Anil Bijawat has over four decades of experience in the building materials industry and has worked with leading ceramics brands at senior management positions. He has led all aspects of businesses from PLN management, sales, marketing, setting up plans, procurement, distribution, and strategy. 
He joined Arike Ceramics in 2018 and is today leading the India operations, focusing on the, developing the Indian market for the organization and building up on the work that has been done in the last couple of years. And please welcome Mr. Vinod Rohira, CEO of Mindspace Business Park, Reed. Uh, Mr. Rohira will be joining us soon, but here is a brief introduction to him as well. With over 25 years in the real estate industry, Mr. Vinod Rohira has been part of the K Raheja Corp group that has pioneered the concept of landmark business districts, premium residential offerings and retail complexes. Having led the development of grade A commercial real estate across the country and listing of Mindspace Business Park's REIT, India's second REIT on the Indian Stock Exchange, which raised rupees 4,500 crore in August 2020. His focus is on driving the commercial business's strategic operations with an emphasis on stakeholders management and business development. Once again, I would like to thank our esteemed panel for joining us today. Uh, without further ado, I now hand it over to our moderator, Mr. Ramesh Nair, to begin our discussion on design build trends. Over to you, Mr. Nair. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, may I have your? Uh, am I audible? Sure. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Good afternoon Great. to you. Yeah. May I have your uh, attention, please? Uh, so, welcome to this uh, unique panel. Uh, it's titled uh, "Design and uh, Build Trends." Uh, my pleasure and privilege to be moderating the session. Uh, we've uh, thank you for welcoming all the expert uh, panelists, uh, all stalwarts of the industry. Uh, my name is uh, Ramesh Nair, and uh, I work with Colios Asia. I'll be serving as your uh, moderator today. Uh, the subject is uh, very uh, timely, and uh, our effort uh, is to provide uh, you with timely topics and uh, interesting uh, speakers. Uh, with that, I'll uh, go to the first question. Uh, Vinod, uh, let me start with uh, you. Uh, is Vinod there? I don't uh, see Vinod uh, as yet. You know this. Uh, not yet uh, joined. So, Sumit, uh, let me start with uh, you then. Sumit, uh, what are some of uh, the changing needs uh, you've been seeing from the occupiers' uh, side uh, in the last uh, 15, 17 months since uh, this COVID uh, started? And uh, would be very keen to hear from you on the changing needs of occupiers. Yeah, thanks, Ramesh, uh, and welcome uh, the other panelists and the audience today. So COVID changed the way uh, we work and live um, almost overnight. And I think it's likely to have a long-term impact on real estate. While countries are coming out of their strict lockdowns, social distancing is still encouraged. So the long-term impact of COVID is yet to be seen, uh, in my opinion. Uh, however, I do believe that uh, this pandemic has the potential to become one of the biggest tipping points for the future of offices, uh, impacting corporate location strategies, uh, office design and management, as well as several occupier practices. So uh, many corporates have been allowing flexible working in some form for years, right? Before the pandemic, working from home was a privilege uh, for the IT sector. But with the first wave of the pandemic, all the industry had to create makeshift remote working provisions. Now with the second wave uh, of this pandemic, it has really driven home the realization that the way we work and the role of the physical office has indeed changed. So there's a growing understanding that the physical workplace isn't somewhere where only employees turn up every day and do their jobs. So they present an amazing opportunity to reconfigure existing spaces away from that uh, you know, generic sea of desks to which we have been accustomed to and towards environments that empower employees to do their best. So the, in the future, when working in the office, employees will have more choice in the spaces they use to accomplish their work, provided they can do it safely. And they will have technology and services to integrate their physical worlds and the digital worlds, accelerating many of the design trends that we would have been seeing even before COVID. Workplace change was inevitable. However, what we expected to evolve over time, I think transformed almost overnight in response to this pandemic. And these exceptional circumstances are like that elastic band, which is stretched to its limit. It will go back, but not completely. So the role of the office, I think long term, is vital to provide what we crave, 
in an office culture community and connection essential after this emotional and physical impact of the pandemic so if i want to uh, you know sort of summarize with five key takeaways that we are listening from our occupier clients number one more flexible work is expected hybrid work isn't new it's now the normal now hybrid work will require hybrid workplaces however the physical office will remain as important as it was before number 3 portfolio adjustment is bound to happen with occupiers pursuing lease renewals optimizing portfolios yes we are seeing some relocation plans on hold but readjustment op- operational efficiency will be the buzzword number 4 long term strategies are under consideration uh, people will not go with short term mid term strategies perhaps uh, as they used to do before the workplace is quickly changing workplace transformation is still trending away from the dedicated private space uh, towards a shared collaborative space and this is critical for workplace efficiency and satisfying that hybrid workforce in essence we will see and we are already seeing that the whole space is being rebuilt around the employee experience and it is more important and relevant today than it was ever before thank you uh, thank you sumit uh, let me move to uh, that is a very good uh, summary uh, sumit i think you covered a lot of points uh, there uh, sheetal let me come to you uh, the next point what are some of the design uh, big changes you've been seeing at the workplace uh, post covid yeah i think you're on mute uh, sheetal yeah i'm audible now yes audible please go ahead Yes, so there's been definitely, uh, you know, complete rethinking on the workspace. Uh, but as Sumit mentioned, the core still remains the same. What we are seeing is that, uh, you know, uh, there is a physical office which is required, which becomes a central focus of, uh, you know, where because eventually what clients, our clients are feeling is that end of the day, face to face meeting is important for uh, is re- important. So a hybrid solution where they're allowing. there uh, quite a few employees to work from home but at the same times you know giving them flexibility to come to office so what they are doing right now is reevaluating their requirements to the fact that you know do they need to make the office uh, with only 60 70% uh, you know desk uh, you know dedicated desk and remaining is a floating population with hot desk which we used to kind of uh, you know encourage earlier and try to push now that's become easier for us because uh, They, uh, you know those things are coming in line much more easily they are uh, earlier uh, you know when people used to be looking at per square feet uh, you know per person per square feet going to a very high density now it's back to uh, giving more space uh, per workstation looking at environment because they're realizing that you know environment and nature getting that nature in is important because when this last year taught us a lot they taught us that you know no one wants to be in concrete jungle so that nature is coming back which we used to advocate so much now that's become easier because a uh, lot of importance is being given to the wellness a lot of importance is being given to sustainability because then you know this also gave us one year uh, all these uh, companies to really think on uh, how environment and designing for the environment will help in cost reductions so what's happening is that focus is changing to uh, to actually rethink how much space do they really require not only per person but also reducing their you know making it more minimalistic and giving more collaborative spaces with of course taking care of uh, you know the social distancing next is design around the environment that's the next focus which is getting nature in giving wellness an important uh, you know where fresh air and uh, you know co2 sensors all these technologies are now uh, being taken care in offices more and more so it's like more trending towards that uh, the finishes the materials again they are getting importance low because health and wellness has become of prime focus so easily cleanable surfaces a uh, lot of digital technology touchless faucets touchless surfaces all that is gaining a lot of importance so that's the shift that we see so now uh, they move up. and then again what's happening is earlier it was more open offices the shift we are seeing is 
while it's an open office, but then there are still modules. So now there are more of modules coming in that, you know, let's say a 50, pe uh, 50 people like, uh, so the office is kind of getting into a self-sustained 50 module. And then there's another space which is self-sustained. So that, you know, the intermixing is there, but it's, it's, it's still divided. So those kind of trends is what we are seeing, which is uh, coming in there in the offices. So there's, of course, a new way of working, a lot of digitalization, a lot of focus on IT infrastructure, because uh, they're going to be future ready. Thank you, uh, Sheeta. Let me come uh, to Ravi uh, with the next uh, question. Uh, Sumit spoke about uh, how the needs are changing of the occupiers. Uh, Sheetal spoke about how the design changes. Ravi, I want you to touch upon uh, what are the technology changes uh, which you're seeing uh, at the workplace uh, post-COVID uh, in the last few quarters. Yeah. Hi, hi, Ramesh, and thanks uh, for calling me. And big hi to Sheetal, Sumit, and Vinod that's also joined. Anil, I've never met you. Um, so what bigger demonstration of technology than work from home? So Ramesh, this COVID has taught us, did we ever hear of Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Hangout any time before this? We used to meet, meet each other at the airports, used to travel, physically go to sites, physically meet people and look what technology has done for you. The airline industry is down, the hospitality industry is down, um, so technology can be disruptive. It has taught us to work remotely, taught us to de design remotely. Um, but I think uh, in the earlier part of this presentation, Mr. Contractor hit the nail on the head. How long can we work in this manner, right? Work from home has its limitations. We are a hunt evolved from a hunter-gatherer tribe, so we need to go out to hunt. Right. So and, and we need we can't be um, doing multiple activities within the four walls of your home. Right. So um, so technology in a way has enabled us to work remotely. Um, uh, what I see is designing whenever we are putting pen on paper, technology always helped us visualize, simulate and um, and, and uh, really get um, to see before you build it. But what I see as a huge disruption now is how technology along with artificial intelligence is going to help you in your construction, in the build. Uh, already I've, I've come across a couple of firms which has a drone survey for architectural projects to the, to the accuracy of 10 mm, which cannot be done even when I'm physically present at site, right? It can pinpoint errors which are happening um, on your site while construction, it can pinpoint um, you know, hard uh, for your interior spaces, uh, you have GoPro cameras mounted on the helmets of workers and you sitting at in, in uh, Mumbai, you could you could, uh, you know, take a look at the project which is happening at uh, Manipur. And, uh, and that's how technology can give you data real time. So it's all about gathering data, disseminating and therefore artificial intelligence is going to play a huge role in in taking all of this information together what's fashionably called as IOT, but it goes beyond that. And, and that's where I feel that um, um, errors are going to be minimized. Uh, technology is going to be really disruptive unless delicately handled. There will come a point in time when um, people are going to, at least the new generation, is going to ask you to switch off all the cameras in your workspace. You can't have Big Brother watching you when you're working there. And in the guise of you know IoT, energy saving, etc., you're going to have uh, that too happening. So while we've gone way ahead in in getting in technology into your workspace, IoT to you know to gather data on utilization and energy efficiency, etc., it's also going to go down the same way because there is invasion of privacy, and therefore you're going to find um, a barrier to technology as well. But yeah, if you use it wisely, as any other tool. Uh, you're going to give, uh, you know, reap rich rewards. So that's my take on how technology is going to help you. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks, Ravi. Very good. Uh, Samari Vinod, let me uh, come to you. Now, you're one of the largest uh, office uh, owners uh, in the country. And uh, many, uh, a lot of your clientele is still uh, uh, IT companies. And many IT companies are still uh, working out of home, especially the global uh, in-house centers. So as, uh, as one of the largest developers in the country, uh, what are you doing to uh, give, uh, give that comfort to uh, occupiers in uh, returning back to uh, the workplace? Thanks, Ramit. Sorry, I had 
<clears throat> some challenges to get through this new app out of all the other apps that Ravi mentioned in any case <laughs> to log in. <laughs> Finally, straight forward when I got it through on my phone and all the other devices were not working. So, uh, I'm you guys from so uh, the, the biggest takeaway I have from what Ravi really said is that all that he's doing sitting at home with all of this technology is essentially to de design a building to be built in brick and mortar. So when you actually got to build that means you're building for the real tangible occupier. Now, when you actually go to the real tangible occupier and while I uh, heard the other panelists speak a little bit uh, while I joined in with regard to obviously the, the health and safety protocols, it's not something that while we as developers, asset owners, we will do everything it takes. And I can assure you it's far more safer than your own residential societies. I can't say your own home because when you don't step out, you're not hopefully going to get infected. But otherwise, if you're a social animal and you're stepping out for anything anyways, you're far safer at the workplace than you are anywhere else. Because for a, some sad reason, if if uh, you catch COVID at the workplace, it looks like the asset manager has manufactured it for you. So we have to be doubly sure about making sure that the environment around at the workplace from whatever protocols and systems and sanitization uh, kind of layers that we might add on will ensure that that is dramatically minimized. Having said that, Ramesh, coming back to the workplace is really driven by two things, if you ask me. One is uh, obviously how your global decision makers are seeing this about returning back to work and post the second layer of vaccinations and uh, people talking about a booster vaccination in Europe and America, uh, you are seeing a strong nudge towards getting back to the workplace. Now, when that happens, you will get mandated here to get back to the workplace. It's a matter of time. Once you're completely doubly vaccinated and uh, after that if you are willing to go to the mall and the mall tells you I want you with double vaccination and a cinema theater tells you give me a double vaccination to come and watch a movie your employer is going to tell you you are doubly vaccinated please come to work so while all of that happens uh, I mean obviously there are situations which will kind of push you to say can I change the building design for good now, if we start changing for a COVID existent world, it's very difficult because you may have probably more elevator cores than the workspace. Just to give you one example. So you can't do that. You'll have to have individual toilets. You'll take your key home uh, with that toilet and come back and manage to clean it and use it. Now, you can't do any of those things. right? So we may put in layers of sanitization. The bottom line is that you have to conquer the pandemic. And when you get back to work, certainly like uh, uh, the previous speaker spoke, absolutely right that you will now de-densify your workspace. You may get back to partition spaces, cabin spaces, a little more elbow room in your common areas, your recreational areas, your corridor sizes. All of those will start to get slightly more liberal. It cannot be in a COVID world kind of design because you'll end up at 250 square foot a person. I'm very happy if that happens. Uh, you will end up at 100, 120, 130 square foot a person kind of density. And of course, as developers, we are doing a lot more number of staircases, size of corridors, size of lobbies, elevator densities, toilet densities, air quality circulation, number of AHUs, the layers and quality of the AHU and air handling units, the common area touch points, services, all of that is now getting highly energized with protocols for health and safety, whether it's surface treatment, chemical treatments, elevator sanitization protocols, you name it. And if a client tells you this is what I need, then there's no question that we don't, uh, we're not going to kind of provide it. We will provide it. So we are ahead of that curve. Uh, and where I can tell you India is probably ahead of a lot of global buildings I know, which have not even done half of what India is doing because of the influence of technology related footprint companies who are kind of really sensitive to this. So I think Ramesh, we are in a good place from there, but the bottom line is, you have to want to be nudged to go to work. Mind you, 18 months, we have found a very different balance working from home. You had your children right next to you. Uh, you had your balance of exercise and diet. Uh, you had connected responsibilities with family. So now suddenly when you have to sit in office from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and take two hours to go in and out, you're challenging that in your mind. 
So it will take you three months to even fight that. But I can tell you, I have started working from 1st of July in office. And I think it is far, far more productive working from office than working from home. You can multitask. You have people across. You can remember and get things done right away instead of blocking a Zoom call timetable. So you're not able to do uh, probably 30% of what you're now able to do in the office. So for me, the more I'm working in office and our teams are all in office, I think the efficiency is just doubled up. So we have to choose whether we're doing mundane work or we want to do putting with stuff. For that, you need to be engaged. You need to be across the table. If there's a design direction meeting with an architect, it takes me one hour for 10 decisions, which I could do in 10 minutes in a, in a joint meeting call. Vinod, let me ask you this question. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel more Indian companies are getting their employees uh, to their offices than multinational companies. That's one. Uh, second, I also feel that non-IT companies are getting their employees uh, more into offices than IT companies. Am I, am I right? Uh, are you seeing any trends around it? You have a large portfolio. And do you have any numbers around that? Uh, you're absolutely right. If you take any of the MSMEs, the small and medium enterprise offices in India, they're all between 70 and 100% full. Everyone's back to work. Obviously, your global employer has not mandated you to start coming to work at that density. So you have paused. The minute your global employer mandates you to start coming to work, you will see the numbers change drastically. That's really the, the key difference. And you will have a better hang if you take 80% uh, of the commercial space to really tech space. But how do you address uh, a situation like in Mumbai where uh, public transport is still uh, challenging? How do you address that? That's the challenge. They, I mean, you cannot address the public transport system, Ramesh. You have to address COVID. And bottom mm. line is just be hopeful that with double vaccinations, uh, we are going to bend that curve. It's going to be around with us for the next 12 to 18 months, in my view. It's just that it's going to tape dramatically if we are adequately vaccinated and we are protocoled as, a, as, a, uh, a, as an ecosystem cumulative. So whether you're in the train, whether you're in, in the public transport, you're in Ubers, uh, whether properly vaccinated and in mass, and the densities have to come down to uh, sensible levels, no longer are you going to find people hanging from the door of the train and all of that. And that was long overdue. Fortunately, with, with this, people will anyway expect density. So those Thanks. are the changes that take place. I think. Go ahead, Vinod. Just go ahead. So that's really what uh, we will have to evolve with. In, in, and when, when that kind of stabilizes, you'll be over the curve. I don't think anything is just that the fine line where it just goes away or is there. We have to adapt to this new uh, new lifestyle, so to speak. Thanks, Vinod. That was quite a detailed uh, answer. Let me ask Anil the next uh, question. Anil, uh, what are some of the changes uh, you're seeing on uh, materials, building materials, new materials, uh, which one is uh, using in construction uh, post-COVID uh, in the last few uh, months? See, it is, it is a, a gone conclusion that the times have changed. and. Uh, we can see the world now in pre and post covid era and uh, whether we like it or not but that's how it is and uh, i mean it it essentially means that you need more space and you need hygienic places to work in and sanitization and all these uh, i mean uh, distance all these have become very important uh, like vinod sab said that uh, you need more space, 130 square foot of uh, space per person. So the density has to be reduced. And, uh, you know, as a, as a manufacturer of tiles, what I have seen, it was very difficult uh, during the lockdown period to carry on with our business as usual. Because uh, tile is one uh, thing which you cannot decide virtually. I mean, you can do a lot of activity virtually. But choosing a tile or even, uh, you know, when we, when it is being manufactured, you, you cannot uh, oversee the work also, how it is going, how are things happening. So even that becomes challenging. The moment the lockdowns open, my people had to get on the ground. And the moment they used to get on the ground, uh, the fallout was there. I mean, I am very 
concerned about it and uh, though we never wanted even the team was you know they were all uh, uh, spirited to uh, you know they were seeing so many people going around fighting uh, corona so they would say sir if that's the only way to work we will do it and uh, as a result you know after the first uh, wave 40% of our people got infected but nevertheless with the there was a serious demand always whenever we wanted to get a tile approved sheetal will confirm to me that if anybody wanted tile to be confirmed they wanted to see it physically unless they touch and feel they cannot decide but yes uh, we we have uh, you know tried to meet this gap and going forward i think every business is as you say that the moment the global masters are going to mandate it that everybody has to come to the space the spaces will have to be like that we have to redesign the spaces to suit uh, that kind of a uh, environment and uh, fortunately i must tell you that ceramics is one of the man made products it's a it's a wonderful product uh, not because i work for this industry or i worked for this industry but i tell you it is one of the most versatile uh, man made material which can substitute practically any surface you can you can have uh, stones uh, replaced with it you can have even laminates uh, replaced with it you can replace wood of course not uh, the solid part of it but the surface part of it you can definitely uh, you know substitute with tiles there are and especially now you know tiles with the near zero porosity with they have become the craze now vitrified tile what we call the full body vitrified tiles are in vogue now they are being used much more than what they were being used earlier and uh, post covid it makes more sense because these are the tiles with near zero porosity they just don't allow any bacterial or microbial activity to happen on their surfaces more over that now well whenever we are making those glaze varieties of the tiles there are you know glazes with germicidal properties so those tiles come in more handy now for all the architects to use them in every surfaces so uh, as far as you know ceramic uh, sanitary ware manufacturing is concerned you know we we have faucets and sanitary ware in our range and what sheetal was mentioning that now uh, the touchless uh, commodes the touchless uh, flushing systems the sensor based uh, faucets all these things are a reality and they are much more in use and i think they are more necessary to be used now and uh, companies like uh, rak when you know where for us r and d is not an cost uh, center it is a growth engine for us and whatever needs that are coming up post covid we are trying to you know tweak our pr production facilities we are bringing in whatever technologies that are required to keep up keep pace with it and as in the first uh, keynote address uh, uh, mr uh, hafiz contractor said that they have to be affordable also and deploying these technologies doesn't essentially mean that we would uh, you know jack up our prices uh, or uh, look up for huge margins always it is the culture and especially in the ceramic uh, tile industry my builder friends must have seen it my architect friend must have seen it that the prices rather they have all all the manufacturers have made the technology pay rather than you know making the customers pay for the technology in a sense that they have maintained the prices for last 10 years you can see that uh, in the tile segment the moment new technology came in the benefits were passed on and uh, this has been the culture at rak as well we have uh, made the technology pay to the customer to the users and uh, we are trying to make uh, these spaces more and more affordable if you would uh, consider more and more usage of ceramic tiles vitrified tiles particularly i am sure we can you know we have got such a large variety now in the in this new era when you are designing the uh, office spaces or anything you have to have you know outdoor and indoors uh, integrated so for outdoors also we have got a large variety of tiles which can be used outdoors we are also making those uh, climber range of tiles which are you know uh, roof tiles which uh, reflect uh, solar heat so the ambient temperature within the indoor spaces can be uh, very uh, you know much lower than the outside temperatures and that reduces reduces the cost of air conditioning in the buildings the ventilated facades which are possible 
with our vitrified ties, the large slabs that we manufacture. So all those going forward, I mean, the more spaces are required and you need more sanitized spaces. So when you require more spaces, you need uh, materials which are easy to lay, which are easy to fix and faster to do. And there is low, hardly any wastages. So, I mean, that's how we are coming up with these kinds of innovative products through our R&D. And uh, we are working very closely with our architect friends. And uh, I'm sure all these products are now becoming a craze, uh, so to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let Thank me you. let me go to uh, Sumit uh, next. Sumit, uh, uh, you're one of the leading uh, project management uh, companies uh, in the country. Where is uh, demand coming from? Which uh, sectors are you seeing uh, demand, and uh, how is uh, how do you see the project management uh, industry uh, expected to uh, evolve and grow uh, in the future? So I'll answer this question in two parts in terms of the emerging sectors um, that are driving the demand. Oh, one, obviously, is the logistics sector. Uh, very clear. Uh, uh, thanks to the global growth in online retail, uh, logistics was a sector already in vogue. Now the pandemic has only accelerated it. So with more people than ever before using online retail, uh, the market is forecast to deepen longer terms. Uh, also, uh, globally, if you see, one of the most widely felt impacts of the outbreak is in manufacturing and the supply chain. And I'm just quoting statistics. In 2003, at the time of SARS, China was uh, less integrated into the global supply chain. And they constituted only 4% of the world economy. It now stands at 16%. And that's a IMF number. So companies uh, are looking to diversify the supply chains across uh, several global locations just to insulate against any possible future incidents. We have seen that in our projects happen significantly in the last 12-15 months. Uh, something that we have even heard our colleagues in the US, in the UK, where the supply chain literally broke down. Uh, then industrial and warehousing space. So obviously absorption is expected to grow significantly this year, next year, as our research team says, and even going by uh, the several IPC reports that we get to read. This is driven by, uh, I think, the robust growth in e-commerce and the manufacturing sectors, as well as the rising uh, demand in emerging tier two and tier three cities. Uh, the three PL and the e-commerce sectors are continuing to drive the warehousing demand. I think it accounted for more than 60% of the total absorption in 2020 alone. Uh, additionally, I think there is strong macroeconomic fundamentals. The government's policy support on several of these will only help, right? Uh, this subset class of logistics. Uh, India is also emerging as an alternate manufacturing investment destination. So foreign manufacturing companies are planning to shift a lot of their manufacturing bases to India. So this will lead to increased demand for both uh, ready, high-spec, fitted out, and custom-built industrial spaces uh, across uh, you know, several states which have these policies that are conducive to such growth. Uh, and the sectors that we believe will grow significantly in this will be FMCG, energy, uh, automobile, pharma, medical devices, uh, data center. Uh, India's data center market is already primed for rapid expansion owing to factors such as uh, the growing demand for data, data protection, then digital India initiatives, uh, adoption of cloud with under construction capacity of uh, 850 plus megawatt and land acquisition as I uh, hear uh, in excess of 1200 megawatt. India is on its path to achieve a 3000 megawatt data center capacity in the new future. And it will uh, serve perhaps as a regional data center hub in APAC soon. Apart from all these, obviously there is sustained IT sector growth still. I mean, in H1, if you see the total grease leasing, gross leasing activity, uh, IT was more than 50%. Uh, and the demand will come in again. But these sectors like e-commerce, healthcare, FMCG, uh, they will continue to drive the market apart from the office market. So in terms of what is the market for PM services uh, and how it will grow in the future, look, uh, the real estate sector in India is expected to reach a trillion dollar by 2030, right? And by 2025, it's supposed to contribute 13% of the country's GDP. So there is enough and more, uh, whether it's corporate offices, industrial warehousing, logistics, data centers, growth will be there. Uh, 
if you say of um, in short term sense, uh, it can be even assisting occupiers uh, to adjust portfolios, uh, optimize and repurpose spaces through workplace studies, change management, implementation plans. A lot of occupiers are actively looking to figure out what needs to be done there. They're looking for advice. So basically, uh, you know, find solutions that help uh, these large occupiers uh, manage readiness, uh, they prepare their workforces, and they allocate support for a seamless return to work. So a lot of them uh, are deciding to return to work. They just need to know how they would. Uh, we can fill that gap. We can actually be a conduit to that. Second, it's muted. That's uh, great, Sumit. Let me uh, ask uh, Vinod uh, the next uh, question. Vinod, the... Uh, uh, Ravi spoke about some of the technologies, uh, new things which is happening. What are, what are some of the key technology changes you have made, uh, especially in construction over the last uh, few quarters? So I wouldn't say uh, <coughs> anything dramatic that has changed from an actual execution point of view, except for the fact that, of course, you are taking your labor far more seriously yeah, health and safety protocols have become priority. A lot of the attention is given to equipments, which are individual to each of these guys. A lot of their dependencies on work, which was more manual, is now becoming more instrumentally aided. So a lot of those smaller changes have already taken place at the construction space. <clears throat> and they are in a far better place, if you ask me, from an execution point of view. From a technology execution of civil RCC on site, nothing has really changed. Uh, of course, the elevator uh, designing is changing. The way you want to have the treatment towards your occupiers who are going to use these elevators is changing. We are actually discussing a lot with a lot of the elevator companies that if I have to fill in four people in a 20 passenger elevator, the guy will come to work at 9 a.m. and get on his desk at 12 noon. How do we change that? So by default, they have to make sure they change the air quality management inside of these elevators. Touchless and all of that is too elementary. We have to find a way where you're safe with, with 15 people inside that elevator. What can we do? So those are the kind of things we are right now discussing because your throughput is all of these things. Otherwise, you'll stagger your workplace. You'll stagger your timing. You may be able to maximize with 30 or 40% occupancy within your office. You won't be able to go beyond of that. So all of those things put together are still at work in progress in, in my view. But I don't know whether we have to take that step for assuming that now for life this is changing or we are hoping and praying that in the next 12, 18 months we would be in a different world post the pandemic era. And we will make the relevant changes definitely, but it won't be tectonic in that sense. Otherwise, we may be thinking of a different workplace altogether uh, besides of everything that's got discussed here. I don't think anyone has that on the drawing board. But a lot, lot of, of a lot of technology is coming into execution so that you the speed of execution is not dependent on labor alone now. You're bringing in technology to build faster. Got it, Vinod. The, with that, I'll uh, open the Q&A session uh, from the audience. Do we have any questions coming in from the audience here? Shrin, uh, how do the audience ask questions? Is it through the private chat or? Shrin is checking on that. So, uh, to, you know, just take uh, one more question with the panel on that. Uh, we could do that. Sure. In the meanwhile, we will just shortlist a couple of questions. Uh, and we'll see what all have been coming in. Sure. Uh, let me ask Ravi the next uh, question. Uh, uh, Ravi, uh, how do we increase uh, the volume of uh, fresh air intake and uh, reduce uh, the amount of recirculated uh, air within offices? That seems to be a concern which a lot of people uh, have been having over the last few months or coming back. Uh, any ideas around that? So, Ramesh, I think I'd like to go get back to the basics or the fundamentals of architecture. So when we we uh, taught architecture, we are, uh, the first uh, two elements, the two important factors which come into your mind is light and air. 
right? Without which we can't survive. So air conditioning is a, just an add-on. So ideally, um, even before the pandemic started, we were all conscious about the energy consumption bit, and everyone was going after after LEED certifications and GRUA certifications. But at Edifice, what we did differently was how can we engage uh, the entire, all the stakeholders, which includes the client, the, the, the HVAC engineers, the structural engineers, and make the building more uh, uh, energy efficient, more lean in construction. So even before the pandemic started, we, um, at, at last count, I think we are working on one net zero and close to three net zero buildings now in, in, as we speak. And what we learned, and this started before the pandemic even you know came into uh, to effect. So what we learned was how can we first reduce demand, right? And the critical aspect is your energy guzzling happens through air conditioning. So um, while you're reducing demand, we are, we've actually designed two buildings and executed where the common areas of all the of this commercial space in Bangalore is non-air conditioned. So it's cross ventilated, you give um, and, and therefore you're, you're saving on energy. So there was reliance on, you know, natural air, uh, it, it, which which uh, which forced us to think laterally and not just the architects, as I mentioned, even the HVAC engineers were, we pushed the design envelope to to evolve new ideas of how, see India, we've, we've all grown from a frugal, uh, uh, you know, back, back, uh, upbringing, right? Everything was available in in um, bits and pieces, power cuts galore. My dad used to ask me to switch out the fan when we walked out of the room. And uh, that was our morning alarm, right? When we were young. So somewhere along the line, we lost this uh, frugality, right? And uh, we need to get back to the basics. So already a lot of the spaces is treated fresh air and not conditioned air, okay? That's the first important rule. Post pandemic, Obviously, um, more fresh air changes are required. Therefore, more energy is consumed. Therefore, you are uh, actually going against uh, your rules of energy saving. So what we've done differently right now is look at why we need to do these things, where we need to take care of filters, the retained air is go goes through HEPA filters and so on and so forth. I think as architects, we have a bigger role to play in, in finding out what can be done to get air conditioning redefined, right? So at last count, I think we are doing eight buildings with radiant cooling, right? And people used to warn us, don't go the radiant cooling route. There will be condensation. You can use it in a hot, dry environment. Don't try it in a hot, humid space. But we've already tried and successfully handled these projects and delivered, uh, I think, four of them. So we are looking at ways where we can get in more fresh air, uh, treat the return air, but how can I reduce the air conditioning load? Because the minute I get in more fresh air, I'm consuming more energy. So how can I reduce my air conditioning load one by reducing demand? Second is by using new forms of, uh, you know, air conditioning technologies which is actually old uh, and opposing this convectional route of air conditioning and using radiant cooling. So it's a, it's a combination of these factors, which is, which is saving you on energy as well as giving you a healthy, indoor air quality, uh, which is conducive for working. And I'm not taking away all the, uh, the the technologies which have gone into how do we take the return air, how do we get this UV filter in place when you're supplying, all that is a given. But I'm saying go back one step as architects, we have a bigger responsibility. Am I saving money for my client on his operational costs, not the capital costs, on his operational costs? So I have to weigh both and then look beyond laterally at new ways of air conditioning spaces. Just to add to what Ravi said, the challenge Ramesh is the reverse. Customers are asking, I will do fresh air intake, I don't care about the electricity consumption. Now at that point in time, you're in a dilemma. So you want the, the in, instead of a six, six out of ten, they want now ten in terms of air exchange. So they're saying we want a hundred percent air exchange right now. Now, if you do all of those things, like we rightly said, we have to completely fundamentally change and you don't have global uh, large manufacturers of all of these cooling machines thinking differently as of now. They are very happy if you buy the same conventional chiller, go and increasing the capacities and then go on supplying all of Your static is changing, so energy consumption is going to change because of that. 
So you can do monumental stuff, but in large scale volume, at the end of the day, especially Ramesh Ka, Nachmi, Sub Dollar, and where do you go with all of that? So when all of that happens, then you're fine trying to find the balance. So today, if you see 1.1 kVA power consumption story, it's gone to 0.55 kVA with water cool chillers, etc. Correct. And you can still bring it down. If the client asks you connected load, he's still asking you 0.8 and 1 kV per 100 square feet, even though you use 0.5. You still have to put the DGs in place. You still have to do the conventions. You can't fight with your customer. Got so it. Those we'll platforms will have to work together. I think because it's very important we go in that way. Got it. Uh, there's some audience questions. Let me start with uh, Ravi on the first question. Uh, Mr. Hafiz contractor spoke about uh, creating vertical uh, uh, compact cities. Is this uh, a possibility, a reality in our country? Ravi, you want to take that? Quick answer, 30 seconds. So I, so I went through Mr. Contractor's statement on condensation and going vertical. So there are two clear distinct lines of thought. One is uh, uh, limit the mess of urbanization, condense it and go vertical. vertical. The other is what uh, Urban Ezra Howard propagated as a garden city where you go horizontal and you spread from a central business district outwards like a typical American city. So I am all for going vertical. Having said that, don't devoid the city of its green spaces. So while you're going vertical, please do give enormous amounts of green spaces, green lungs, spaces which are which an urban um, you know settlement is devoid of. Um, it is it is a reality. I mean, cities have shown you that, it, and, and National Geographic carried a, an article on both these forms of development. And what the experts propagate is what Mr. Contractor propagated. It is a reality. You need to go vertical, but at the same time, give adequate uh, uh, access, democrat, democratize these access to public spaces, um, sea fronts, water fronts, and don't have just the elite hog up all these. Um, you know, access uh, uh, these public spaces. So you need to give access to uh, great public spaces as well as go vertical in nature. It is a real. God. God. Thanks. Uh, Ravi, I have a question uh, from another one of our uh, audience. Uh, the question is about, is there a demand seen for specialty contractors to maintain spaces uh, as uh, these are opening up? You want to give it a shot, Sumit? So I'm not too very sure if I understood the question pretty well. Uh, Specialty contractors to maintain spaces. So if it is talk, uh, so if the question is about, uh, you know, how do you manage post COVID in terms of, I think there's another question on what are the new trends in facility management services as spaces are opening up. Yeah, uh, you could so give that, uh, you think, could answer yeah, that if you want. Yeah, so I think uh, both of this, typically would mean uh, a lot of stress and a lot of focus on uh, health and safety in terms of how you manage maintain spaces. So obviously the cleaning schedule uh, right to how the occupancy levels are and you can't really count the number of people that are there on the floor. So therefore there are a lot of technology apps that are coming up wherein you can go from as minimum to, uh, to have a seat booking app to uh, a wearable app uh, where you actually can, uh, you know, raise the alarm if somebody is, is uh, you know, sort of coming too close. So there is a wide spectrum of uh, trends, technologies that is coming up. But as you would have heard, uh, and I completely agree with Vinod on that aspect is, are these there to stay? Or is this a temporary phenomenon of 12 to 18 months? Is something that nobody has an answer. But we, I think, in the construction fraternity and in this ecosystem would love to assume that after 12 to 18 months, while things will change a little bit, and as I mentioned, like an analogy of a rubber band, I mean, when you stretch it, uh, it does come back, but it doesn't come back to its original shape. But I don't think that some of these uh, would be uh, completely game changers. There would be things that we will evolve, that we will uh, change, but... Uh, those changes will be temporary in nature and not permanent. Thanks, Sumit. Uh, you've kind of, kind of come to the end of uh, the session. I'll just summarize uh, my key takeaways. Uh, Sumit, you spoke about the long-term impact of COVID is yet to be seen. There's still some amount of uncertainty. 
uh, it's a tipping point for office spaces. You mentioned that physical workspace uh, reconfiguration will happen around the world. You spoke about the three C's, the culture, community, and connection becomes uh, very important. Uh, people are looking for more flexible, more hybrid work. Hybrid work will become the new normal. You also spoke about how physical office will continue to be there and companies will uh, do adjustments in their portfolio and uh, spaces will be redesigned uh, around uh, employee experience. Sheetal was very nice to hear you speak about how companies, uh, how design is being reevaluated. Companies are reevaluating the requirements, more hot desking, you spoke about more space per person, more environment and nature within the workspace, uh, more importance to wellness and sustainability than ever before, more co collaborative spaces, more fresh air, CO2 sensors, and more modular, which is self-sustainable. Uh, so those are some of the big design changes you spoke about. Ravi, it's good, very good to uh, hear about uh, how the hunter-gatherer tribe of humans we need to get out. So we're not going to be working from home uh, forever. Uh, uh, AI, you spoke about how AI will play a huge role uh, and will have impact on IoT. Uh, er errors will be minimized, and uh, but you also warned about how technology will invade uh, privacy. You know, very good to hear you speak about how office buildings uh, are much more safer than residential complexes. All the precautions how people like you are taking in terms of making sure, doubly making sure how uh, you're implementing safety and sanitation protocols. Uh, you spoke about how global decision makers, what their views and vaccination drives. Those will be the two trigger points based on which uh, occupancy and re-entry will happen. Uh, very soon, you said companies will mandate employees to come back to work after double vaccination. You're already seeing it in different parts of the world. You spoke about de-densification, more partitions, more elbow rooms, wider passages. Uh, you spoke about how 100 square feet per person will become 120 square feet per person. And very interesting view, you said uh, MSMEs in most parts of the country are uh, having occupancy of 70 to 100 percent, while multinationals are much uh, lower. Uh, Anil, uh, very good to hear you speak about how the world will be uh, talked about from a pre-COVID and a post-COVID. Uh, you said there's more space, more hygiene required, more re there'll be more redesigning happening. Uh, you spoke about some of the challenges you are facing within the tiles industry. Uh, and you also spoke about how uh, antimicrobial and germicidal properties become very important in uh, construction uh, materials. You also spoke about how things will become more touchless and sensor-based and uh, how your company is also investing more in uh, R&D to make sure uh, products are COVID compliant. Uh, Sumit, again, uh, you spoke about how demand is coming from the logistics sector, uh, manufacturing, supply chain diversification, e-commerce, 3PL, FMCG, pharma. This is some of the big sectors you said uh, is doing well. And uh, I'll uh, end it with uh, Ravi's quote on how it's uh, back to basics and back to uh, frugality. That's a key lesson uh, from uh, COVID. With that, uh, I'll uh, hand it over to the organizers. Ramesh, Ramesh, you never spoke on anything. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of speaking over the <laughs> last few months. <laughs> Time to listen. <laughs> hey, thanks, thanks all you guys. Um, great meeting Thank you, Vinod you. and Sumit. Same here. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Nair, uh, Mr. Nair would have not really spoken much in sharing inputs, but he definitely got all of you to speak a lot for us today and uh, share a lot of great insights. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all our panelists for this insightful discussion. We truly hope that we are able to encourage more and more trends in design build in India in times to come. I would like to thank our presenting partner, RAK Ceramics, for all the support. Thank you, our keynote speaker, architect Hafiz Contractor, our moderator, Mr. Ramesh Nair, our panelist, Ms. Sheetal Rakheja, Mr. Sumit Rakshit, Mr. Vinod Rohira, Mr. Ravi Sarangan, and Mr. Anil Bijavat. Thank you to each one of you for making the time to be with us for this virtual discussion today. Thank you, our audience, for joining us today. Do not forget to tune in for the Construction World Architect and Builder Awards on 20th August. We are just two days away, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you once again, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.